I own a brewery. And I'm sober. Well, at least during dry January. In this video, I'm going to talk about how non-alcoholic beers work, which ones I've enjoyed, and how this category has exploded over the last few years. It's no surprise that January is one of the slower months in the beer industry, but in recent years, we've actually seen a trend of people shifting their drinking habits to less and less alcohol consumption overall not the least of which is just a general trend towards being more health conscious. Thank you, Huberman. Luckily for you though, there are more non-alcoholic beer options than ever before, and some of them are pretty damn tasty. Before we dive into the process, what is a non-alcoholic beer? Well, according to TTB, a non-alcoholic beer is any beer produced that is between 0% and 0.5% alcohol by volume. There's also alcohol-free beer, which means that there is no trace of alcohol in the product whatsoever. So let's dive into how breweries get all that beer with no alcohol. There are two main ways to produce non-alcoholic beer. Dealcoholization and fermented non-alcoholic. Dealcoholization is a process where you brew and ferment a beer in a traditional manner to achieve a specific beer style. Then you remove the alcohol from that beer. And there are a couple of ways to make this happen. The first is vacuum distillation. This is a process where the finished beer is put under a vacuum environment, heated up, and the ethanol from the beer is slowly evaporated, similar to a traditional distillation process. The low pressure environment allows the alcohol to vaporize at a lower temperature than it normally would. Therefore, it disturbs the beer less significantly than it would if you were to distill it at 170 degrees. This lower pressure vacuum environment allows you to vaporize the ethanol from the finished beer at a lower temperature than it would be at normal atmospheric pressure. But there are some downsides to this, including a loss of fermentation character, the esters and phenols that are produced, as well as some of the volatile hop compounds that are in the beer. And in order to achieve this vacuum scenario, you need some pretty hefty and expensive equipment. The second dealcoholization technique is membrane separation. Similar to reverse osmosis with water, you are using membranes that specifically isolate ethanol out of the final beer product, and it separates it so that you can reduce the total alcohol in the volume of beer. This method also requires a large amount of capital investment in the equipment to achieve this process, but it does leave you with a more nuanced beer character and doesn't volatilize all those delicate flavors that are in the beer. Fermented non-alcoholic beers are, well, just that. They're fermented to be low to no alcohol fermentations. And these can be achieved in a couple of different ways. You can use traditional yeast that you would normally use in your brewing process and arrest the fermentation, or you can use specific yeast strains that do not ferment a large proportion of the sugars that are available in the wort in order to yield a much lower alcohol in the final product. In the first example where you use traditional yeast, you wanna start with a lower gravity wort add your yeast, and then you stop the fermentation early before it exceeds the 0.5% alcohol by volume. Things to take into consideration with this method are you're probably gonna have some fermentation byproducts that are not desirable, like acid aldehyde or diacetyl. You're gonna end up with a kind of a wordy, sweet, unfermented beer flavor. And if you don't stop the fermentation in time, the yeast will ferment more than the 0.5% alcohol by volume limit and kind of defeats the whole purpose. So it requires some very precise timing. In my opinion, this method produces the least desirable beer. The second method is using yeast strains that do not ferment the full spectrum of sugars that are in the wort. So instead of using a traditional brewer's yeast that consumes 65 to 75% of the available sugars in the wort, you can utilize specific strains that only consume 10 to 60% of the wort sugars. And in this process, you're also starting with a lower gravity wort in order to stay under that 0.5% alcohol by volume range. The benefit is you don't have to invest in any large or expensive equipment in order to produce a non-alcoholic beer. The downside is there's still a possibility of over-fermenting the beer and producing too much alcohol, as well as not generating as much beer flavor from the fermentation that makes the beer taste like, well, beer. And a little bonus one for you, there is a process called cold contact fermentation where you knock the wort out at cold temperatures and add the yeast at cold temperatures. This arrests the fermentation and the yeast don't really take off. And this is a very simple process, but again, this doesn't allow the yeast to produce a lot of fermentation character and leaves kind of an underwhelming beer. Now that you've produced this non-alcoholic beer, there is one more consideration before you package it up and send it out into the market for people to drink. And that is preservation. Traditional beer contains two big preservatives, that is alcohol and hops. And because of these two things, beer is actually pretty well preserved and it doesn't generally harbor any pathogens that are harmful for human consumption. Non-alcoholic beer, on the other hand, does not have, well, alcohol, and therefore is less preserved than a traditional fermented beer. 
So people need to take extra precautions before sending it out into the market to sit on hot shelves and hopefully not spoil. And to achieve this, there are three ways to do it. Pasteurization, sterile filtration, and pH adjustment. Pasteurization is the process of heating a liquid up to a specific temperature for a specific amount of time to kill any harmful bacteria that may be in the product. And for beer, this can be achieved one of two ways, flash pasteurization or tunnel pasteurization. Flash pasteurization is the process where you send beer through a heat exchanger, rapidly heating it up and cooling it down so that all of the bacteria is killed in an appropriate amount of time. The second is tunnel pasteurization, where you package the product and send it through a tunnel, which basically does the same thing, heats the product up to the pasteurization temperature and then cools it back down. Tunnel pasteurization ends up being the preferred method for beer because once it's in the can and it's pasteurized, it's not getting exposed to any other bacteria or microbes, so it's safe until the consumer drinks it. And although heating up the beer does degrade the flavor to some extent, pasteurization is by far the best way to go about making sure that your beer is shelf stable and not harmful for consumption. Then we have sterile filtration. This method is basically filtering through a medium that eliminates any microbes from the final product. And similar to flash pasteurization, there is still another chance of being contaminated whenever you go into the package, so tunnel pasteurization ends up being the best process. And finally, we have chemical preservatives. This could be pHing the beer down below a 3.5 pH with acids or utilizing specific chemicals that will inhibit the growth of bacteria such as potassium sorbate and sodium benzoate. But changing the final pH of the beer would affect the flavor of the beer and frankly, nobody likes preservatives. So there you go. That's what it takes to produce a non-alcoholic beer. There are a lot of considerations and often it takes a lot of equipment and money to make it happen. But luckily for us, there are a lot of really great beers on the market that are non-alcoholic, and I'm gonna tell you about some of my favorites. First off, we've got Athletic Brewing. These guys started a non-alcoholic craft brewery and have absolutely killed it. The beers are pretty great across the board. This Cerveza Athletica is probably my favorite. And the growth they've had in the last few years is just a testament to how this category within beer is blowing up right now. The second one is Heineken 0.0. .0. While it's not the most flavorful beer, it's definitely my go-to for the large macro, light, non-alcoholic beers. And one of the things I really prefer about it is that it is 0.0% alcohol, meaning it is alcohol-free. Now the 0.5% is really indiscernible when you're drinking beer, but if you're trying to consume zero alcohol whatsoever, it does take the placebo buzz out of the equation, if you're into that sort of thing. And now for my current favorite non-alcoholic beer, Guinness 0.0. .0. This beer hits all the notes of the traditional beer drinking experience without any of the alcohol. So it's packaged in a 16 ounce can with a nitrogen widget, and once you pour it into a glass, it, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between that and a regular pint of Guinness. And I actually think I prefer the taste of this. I don't know, maybe the withdrawals. So that's my deep dive into non-alcoholic beer. If you two are going through a dry January or just taking a break from beer, I support you. This has been the longest time that I've been without drinking beer, and frankly, it feels pretty nice. Now that there is a plethora of amazing non-alcoholic beer options on the market, it makes it pretty accessible to go out and still socialize and not have to consume any alcohol. And even though I have no intention of stopping drinking forever, I'm definitely going to be working in non-alcoholic beers into the rotation because, frankly, I kind of enjoy it. You get all the beer flavor without any of the alcohol and you can have a few more beers. And having said all that, Definitely go out and support your local breweries because they're hurting right now. January is always a tough time in the industry, and this one's no exception. Even if you're not drinking, go to the brewery, buy non-alcoholic beer or soda water, and maybe grab some food. That's all I got. Cheers.